Welcome, guys, back to the Grateful Living Podcast. Today, I'm thankful to have Captain Cody Rubner with me. Cody is a fishing guide and the founder of Springtide Media, a marketing company that cultivates authentic relationships between outdoor brands and their target audiences using using industry-proven strategies. Cody, thank you so much for joining us. What's up, my man? How are you doing? Good, good. How are you? I'm doing good. Uh, it, it's been a minute. I think, you know, we've I think the last time I saw you was probably 2014, 2015. So it's uh, it's uh, cool to reconnect. I think we're lucky to be in the generation where we're only you know a computer click away from reuniting. So it's pretty cool, man. Yeah, no, it's it's awesome. What a what a difference. Uh, even seven years ago, I'm not. I don't know when Zoom was founded, um, but just the it's it's a totally different world. 2015 compared to 2022. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no. younger, right? Like, it, you know, if our parents said they hadn't seen someone in seven years, it'd be a little different, but that's like, you know, a quarter, just under <laughs> a quarter of our lives. So yeah, pretty cool, man. Yeah. Yeah. But, the, but family is always family. You know, yeah. you never forget <laughs> your childhood. Uh, yeah. And, and all Elm street and basketball can't forget those times. Yes, sir. Uh, so that. <laughs> yeah, we okay. played basketball last night. We got a little church league down here. We play every Tuesday, and I cannot run like I used to. <laughs> yeah, it was a basketball on like one granola bar and yeah. half the water. That that is not the. It's twenty minutes, and I'm I'm done. It's a, Re- yeah, recovery on a full five on five. Like if you play three games, I, I I'm I'm good for the count for the next two days. I, I need some rest. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, Cody, uh, thank you for joining us, you know, kind of for the people that don't know you as well, do you want to, you know, set the scene of, you know, where you grew up, your family situation, you know, what type of kid you were, things like that. Yeah. So, so I actually grew up on Cape Cod in Massachusetts. Um, I lived there for eight, eight or nine years, uh, in elementary school was when I moved up to Acton. Um, and so I went to, uh, uh, the end of elementary school, junior high, high school at Acton Boxborough in central Massachusetts, which is obviously where uh, we cross paths. And yep. then um, after graduation of high school, I actually went up to the, the University of Maine um, to get my degree in marine biology. So growing up by the ocean, fell in love with the ocean. That's, you know, I was one of those kids that hopefully when I have kids, if I have kids, I don't have a kid like me, which is <laughs> moving 24-7 never stopped. I did everything for one year, played every sport once. I like, I had total ADD growing up and uh, my parents were, were really great of always humoring it, always giving me a chance to try everything. But the one thing that stuck with me through everything was fishing. I used to, you know, wait at the door for my dad to get home from the grocery store they worked at 5 p.m. He'd get home about 5.15. I'd be there like, can we go? Can we go to the jetty real quick? The bait shop always closed at 5.30. So he'd just take off his tie. We'd turn around, go get some sea worms or whatever. And we'd go fishing off the jetty as the sun set all night. So that was, fishing was the one thing that slowed me down when I was a little bit of a crazy kid. And, you know, it stuck with me for my entire life. So even as we moved to central Massachusetts for, uh, for some stuff, my dad had some health stuff going on. So we wanted to be a little bit closer to um, Boston, my family and you know, being in central Massachusetts, you know, Acton was landlocked and not in an outdoorsman's paradise, right? Yeah. I think that would be fair to say we had Nara Park, which was like <laughs> you know, mainly rainwater and like nasty frogs and whatever. Yeah. But, um, you know, outside that, you know, we had a couple of rivers or whatever, but it wasn't the great outdoors. There was no oceans, there was no mountains. So um, kept my passion through living there, through reading books, through stuff I consumed on the internet, through trips whenever I could, and then um, made the leap and and went up to, you know, pursue my degree in marine biology, which kind of set the stage for uh, a lot of the stuff I'm sure we'll talk about here. But, you know, my whole life has been based around the ocean. And in the past 10 years, my ways to connect with it and my ways to like study it, give back to it, be involved with it have, you know, changed path a little bit throughout that. So, um, I guess, uh, that, that would kind of be set the stage of where I, where I ended up today. Yeah. Yeah. So, you, you know, you, um, you talked about it a little bit there, but I saw, you know, marine biology and biological oceanic, 
oceanography. I'm not saying that correctly. Oceanography. Uh, buddy. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, did, did you go into UMaine knowing you'd study marine bio or was that like, you know, obviously I, I'm hearing fishing, you grew up on it as a young kid, but did you know that going into UMaine? Yeah. So, uh, went up there for that program specifically. Um, and about halfway through kind of had, you know, so I've always loved the ocean, even, you know, when the, the little details that maybe as kids got to school said, you know, all right, we're going to study marine biology, the things that maybe weeded people out with stuff that interested me. So I always knew that I was going to study it. And it was always, uh, I guess, a life goal of mine to check that box to get that degree. It's, it's kind of funny in marine biology when when I got to school, like you go to Marine Bio 100, it's like the first gen ed of marine biology and there's 350 kids in the class. And there's a lot of, you know, I don't know how to think about the nice way to say this, maybe a lot of naive or, or people that aren't really sure what marine biology is going to be. And they think they're just going to play with dolphins or work at <laughs> SeaWorld. Yeah. Fast forward one year to sophomore year where you're like starting to study like algae and microchemicals and water, your classes are down to like 50 people. Yeah. where everyone's like okay this is not what i thought it was going to be then fast forward to junior year you you drop some more by senior year like my graduating class in marine biology i think it was like 25 kids 30 kids it was a really you know small group so um it, it was what i always wanted to do there were definitely some trying parts through the the lab side and it was really technical so it was not just what i do now which is i love fish and i'm only focused on fish but uh you know, there was a lot of really hard chemistry, organic chemistry, all the stuff that goes into being, being a marine biologist that was uh, a little bit trying. But yeah, that was something I always wanted to do. And about halfway through school, um, I, I had a really interesting or, you know, realization, which is I noticed myself getting way more involved with extracurricular stuff where, you know, I was involved, I started a fishing club and we were traveling the country fishing in tournaments. And I was in a, a you know, a fraternity. I was in a bunch of other groups uh, on campus and I kept finding myself graduating or, or gravitating towards community stuff and not really wanting to be in a lab or the way to get ahead in marine bio was find a, you know, professor that you could volunteer in their lab and get your hours, whatever. So about halfway through school, I realized I wasn't a kid that was destined to be in a lab working with a small group of people that, you know, the, I, this is what I love to do, but I had to try to find a way to be different somehow, manifest it in a different way. And so ended up kind of taking my career towards the business side, but finding a way to work in business for manufacturers, for an industry that's focused on the ocean somewhere. And so I found, uh, you know, as my career has progressed that working in business, there's actually a lot of different ways that can enact change where I can lean on the kids who did stick with the lab work, the science work. I'm connected with some nonprofit groups now and some scientists down here who are brilliant, who bring science to the fight and say, hey, we know X is happening in the ocean because of Y. And I can kind of take that in my role that I'm in now and try to use reach use scale to enact positive change so that was kind of a cool twist where halfway along the way i realized this is what i love to do and i want to drive positive change for for the environment for the earth for our oceans but i wasn't going to do it with a beaker and a test tube which is you know a little bit different so that was yeah. a unique little change that's an awesome awesome point of view uh is there anything you know as you look at your experience maybe there's a uh, a freshman uh, currently, you know, studying marine bio right now that you would say to them on making the most of, you know, again, your degree, your outside school experiences or anything um, as you look back on that? Yeah. So the first would be, you know, if you're going to stick, I have a lot of friends that I graduated with who stayed in the field research side. Um, and the first thing would be that I would say marine biology is definitely a, a passion uh, industry. You have to love it and you have to love and geek out on every little detail of it. Like if you want to get rich, it's definitely not the, the career path. Nobody's going out of school into like a, you know, a field work position, making hundreds of thousands of dollars. It's quite the opposite. Yeah. So I would say the first thing is if you're going to go for it, you need to be focused on it. Like that's what you love to do. 
and that that's what you want to give back to the earth. That's what you want to spend time doing. That's your contribution to society. And if, if you wholeheartedly believe that, then I think you'll find really fulfilling work um, in that. So that would be the first thing. And the second I would say is, you know, uh, I saw a lot of kids that stayed more on the lab route, just really diving in wholeheartedly to your program. So when you get there, if, if you want to work in lab work and field work as a scientist, give every bit you can to that sector, right? So get connected with every professor, find every opportunity to get engaged with the lab, get extra field work, just put 100% of your time and passion towards that if that's the path you want to go. Um, I think the kids that I saw that stayed in the more traditional version of what marine biology is, um, the most successful ones were the ones who just spent every minute in it, whether it was reading textbooks, studying the actual classes, engaging with professors after the classes, lab work, stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, not to go right into a, <laughs> a tougher topic, um, sure. but, you know, we, we talked, um, you know, pre-recording, um, you know, sometime um, around, you know, the end of UMaine, uh, time period, you know, you went through a tough transition and, you know, obviously this podcast is, is bore out of, you know, um, losing a friend of mine to suicide. So, you know, you know, anything that you want to talk about regarding mental health, um, you know, relationships, work, family stuff, um, I'll give you the floor and, and we'll just kind of chop it up, you know, yeah. from there. No, I'd, I'd love to. And I, I'll, uh, relay a little context here. I, I told you I actually work with some of the digital projects I do now, one of which is a podcast and um, pretty well connected within within my industry. And I've had a couple of different opportunities to do podcasts and I've never actually accepted any of them. I, I'm always a believer of it's a long road to wisdom and a short road to being ignored. It's a Lumineers quote of, yeah. of mine, but yeah. uh, in my industry, you know, I just really want to be quiet early and do do my work and I'll tell my stories 50 years from now. So, um, but I really appreciated what you're trying to do with this and um, with the context of with which you you built the project. And that's why I was kind of excited to be involved and, and get on here because this isn't really stuff of ever been asked or, or, or talked about. But um, after school, I, so I got my senior year, second, uh, second half of uh, senior year, had a girlfriend, had, you know, a great, uh, great four years at school. I loved the University of Maine. I was totally proud of everything I did. I had zero regrets. I, I, my schooling was perfect. Everything I wanted out of it, I got out of it. So graduated, I, I was kind of connected with a couple of different smaller companies at the time in the fishing industry, got a job offer. I was going to work in the fishing industry and I was I was really excited, right? Like, they're going to pay me and I'm going to do work to talk about fishing. Like, this is it. I found it. It's my dream job. And the pay wasn't great. Um, but I was like, I don't even care. Like, this is going to be cool. I'm going to get to fish before work, after work, all day talking about fishing. This is my dream. So, um, and had a, a girlfriend of, I think, about a year at the time. Um, she went uh, away overseas for a couple month trip in the summer. Uh, I started work at, at my first job after school. And instantly kind of realized, okay, this really isn't, you know, the, the job for me. It was, it was, I was commuting from Acton area at the time uh, into Boston, uh, which as you know, if you leave at the right time is 25 minutes, 30 minutes. If you leave at the wrong time, it is two and a half hours of yeah. like bumper to bumper. So yeah. I was working long days, really long commute, low pay you know, month, two months goes in. I'm like, man, like this is, this is adult life. This is what I, you know, yeah. what I was excited about. And uh, girlfriend came home from, from her trip. It was kind of, I was going through some work stuff. I ended up going away. Uh, this is probably the least professional thing I've ever done, but I went away to a bass fishing tournament that I was supposed to be fishing at, had some vacation, work was bothering me, turned my phone off for like three days on the trip. I'm like, yeah, this is my last college fishing tournament. I'm not dealing with this and came back ready to quit. So I walked in on Monday morning. I'm like, Hey, you know, I, I think, uh, I think, uh, whatever getting, trying to lead in the conversation. He's like, yeah, we're going to let you go. And I was like, in my head, I'm like, you can't let me go. I'm, I'm here to quit, but so whatever. So we, you know, I leave that job. Um, 
was helping girlfriend with some different stuff at the you know risk of going too into personal details on yeah, the podcast yeah. with that relationship. No so, um, help her with some stuff, and then randomly one day after you know she she broke up with me, and so I didn't get where it came from. Um, ended up finding out some stuff that you know added a whole lot of context to it, but you know I had been broken by my work my my dream of what i thought was going to be after college then my personal relationship was really broken was really hurt about that um then i had a dog so at the time i was probably 22 20 22 yeah, yeah. i had a dog who was nearing 17 so it had been with me my entire life right yeah yeah my dog ends up passing away wow right so yeah. this is all the same window then i'm actually playing a, a basketball league in boston at the time i was commuting in with ned daniel and i'm sure a couple yeah, yeah. Of games you remember i was playing yeah. with one of the teams in a game i step on someone's ankle like the worst possible grade sprain it's yeah. like the size of a baseball i'm in a cast yeah is for a couple of months whatever so i was physically hurt i had dealt with the relationship stuff i dealt with the work stuff and then i had dealt with personal loss all at once yeah, so at the time, I went into, you know, a pretty, pretty dark place, which I was obviously a, you know, a go-getter, a very positive person, really outgoing and just like wanted to be involved in anything, anything and everything. And got to a point where like, I wasn't leaving the house like every day. Wow. And so I was at home with my parents, like my, my idea of where I was going with everything was, you know, a little bleak. And so, um, had a, had a really tough time there for a couple months where, you know, I, I would say it wasn't to like 10 out of 10 on the extreme of, uh, you know, how bad things can get when people really struggle with mental health, but it was a seven, it was an eight. It was, I was climbing towards some things of like, you know, I really shouldn't feel this way with how hard I've worked with how whatever. And so um, that was a really, really trying time for me. I'll actually name drop another, basically the only thing I was doing, and this is, this is pretty, depressing to admit but every day i would wake up and i would drive to the acton library and i would rent like two horror movies like who uses a library when yeah you're a little guy <laughs> I'd go home and i'd like watch a couple movies at my house like eat some chipotle or whatever i did yeah. and i would just go to bed and i did this for like a month two months is the low point the only time i was leaving my house was like once or twice a month i would go meet paul cottenham at <laughs> starbucks wow. in, in acton and it was one book that we were both reading is uh, Gary Vaynerchuk. I don't know if you've heard yeah, of yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was reading Gary V's crushing it right when it just came out. And me and Paul would just go talk about like, you know, our dreams and, and how, how we could manifest it, whatever, how yeah. you know, what the next steps would be. But at the time I had like no guiding light whatsoever. I didn't know what my way out was. My bank account was dwindling as obviously it makes sense. If you're yeah. staying alive and you're not working, your money <laughs> will go down. Yeah. Uh, and so I, I hit a really, really, really low point at that point and had some really good friends still from like fishing events, fishing work from college or whatever. And there were two uh, kind of de defining moments from that the first was I went back to homecoming um, that fall after all that had gone down. And I just like said, all right, I know I just got to be around my people. Something good will come from it. I drove like four and a half hours up there to school just for two days to yeah. be there. And I talked to one of my fraternity brothers who was very successful, like Forbes list, neuro, runs a neurologic music therapy company, like going to change the world yeah. level, successful and I look up to him a ton. And I was telling him like, all this just happened. I'm in a really tough spot. I think I'm going to quit working and fishing. I don't know what I'm going to go do. I'm going to go get some job, but I just think I'm going to separate work from what I love. Mm. You know, maybe it's just too dangerous. And the, one of the more defining things I've been told, and I don't even know, maybe I get a holler at Brian after and let him know how much he, he changed my life. But he told me, he's like, how big is the fishing industry? And so it's really you know, it's big by a total financial scale, but it's small, it's tight knit, it's a certain number of companies. And he said, if you wanted to be the most famous music artist or brain surgeon or whatever, it would take you decades and decades and decades of hard work to be one of the top guys. But yeah. when you're in a smaller industry and just a handful of years, it's such a shorter ladder, 
you might be able to get yourself to like a perspective you really don't, you know, couldn't get to in another industry. So that changed my opinion on things a lot because it made sense, you know, 10 years of experience in the fishing industry. And you're some of the people I know who are the vice presidents of marketing for some of these companies. Yeah. And so, you know, 10 years of being a doctor, you're probably still in school, right? <laughs> yeah. Still really in debt. So yeah. um, that was a really cool moment. Uh, never forget that. And that definitely realigned me to um, stay with, you know, my original life goal. And then the other defining moment would be that <clears throat> at the time I had no money, but I had been in touch with uh, someone that, you know, knew some people at this company, Coast of Sunglasses, and they're saying, you know, you, this would be great. I think this would be a great spot for you, man. You'd, you'd have to move. You'd have to move to Florida, but, you know, it's a great company, really cool. They do all these science things. They also sell good product, and they're all about fishing, like everything to do with this company is about fishing. And so I got told to go down to, oh, there's going to be this event in Martha's Vineyard. Go meet this guy, Mike Holiday. Fast forward, you know, come back to sort of fast forward, whatever that is now, six years, seven years. Mike is like my mentor, closest friend. I, I just moved into the same town he lives in. We, I was just on the water with him this morning. So, oh. um, but at the time I was really depressed and I said, I can't do it. I just like, I don't even want to leave the house. I, so I didn't go to that wow. event, never oh, met. Okay. And got connected with someone else at the, at the company and my buddy Joe was telling me, oh, you got to go. I heard they got this college job where like, you know, you can uh, interview, you'd be doing some college events for them, whatever. You did some college fishing stuff. It might make sense. So got connected with Todd. We chatted on the phone for a little. And he's like, oh, yeah, you know, this gig, here's the details, whatever. What have you been up to? And he's like, oh, we'll, we'll have to chat about it or something. And I said, well, I'm going to be in Florida in two weeks. And I had no plans to go to Florida. Yeah. But I was like, oh, I'm going to actually be visiting a friend. Like, do you think I can come by the headquarters and just get coffee and chat about it? He's like, yeah, sure. Let me know more details. So that same day, I went over to Charlie Elcory's house. Remember yep. Charlie? Yep. And Charlie helped me book. I had like $700 in my bank account at the time. Yeah. And I spent like 600 on a three-day trip, flew down. I had no clue what I was doing. I went right to the coast of headquarters the next day after my flight interviewed with this guy Todd went out fishing with him to try to like gauge how authentic I was how whatever and the next day I got put through the ringer of like seven interviews with everyone from the vice president to the head of sales the head of marketing and the community wow. team and so I did this full interview and came back and I had at that point like almost zero dollars feeling really down on my luck and I've always been uh super super conscious of respect my parents super hard working never taken a dollar from them like as few as I possibly could once I became an adult and started yep. working and so I have almost no money I'm just kind of bumming it at their house for a couple of weeks feeling really down and and this guy Todd ended up calling me and said hey you're, you're going to get a job offer you just got to bear with us it's going to take a little bit so I limped through some one-off stuff to make some money of random projects around acting waited like two months and then I got an email saying like hey Cody we want to present you this job offer I didn't even look at the salary I didn't even look at the details I just sent it back to them I was like yep I'm in fast forward another two weeks and I just packed up the used Honda Pilot I had at the time I bought yeah. from Christmas Motors Pat <laughs> I went over there and uh, Pat's dad helped me out I said I just got a job offer I got no money I just got to get a, a first car here yeah. packed everything you know used Honda Pilot uh, drove across the country, like whatever that is, 1600 miles, had no place to live and started looking around on Craigslist for apartments to, to move into. So, wow. you know, that the, to kind of round that out was I had some, you know, really tough times, but I had some, when things got tough, I leaned in on the people who were always there for me and I respected a ton and, you know, saw the reward tenfold of, of trusting my people and being willing to, to ask for help and let people know that I was struggling. And then the second part of it is like everything that I'm, I'm living my dream life right now. It sounds a little bit weird to say. It sounds, it's a little uncomfortable to say with how much is going on in the world now in the past couple of years. You know, I know a lot of people have had tough times, dealt with loss. And so yeah. it's very strange when things are going good. It's just really humbling and makes me, you know, 
both want to work harder, give back, try to help other people uh, along the way. But, you know, everything that I'm enjoying now and proud of now was just all through one giant leap of faith of like, you know, I felt like I had zero in the tank emotionally, physically, definitely monetarily. And I was like, go for broke. You know, why not? What, what's going to, at this point, what do I have left to lose? You know? And so, yeah. um, that was, that was a, a big leap of faith, but it's been like the defining moments that couple of months for, for better, or for worse shaped my entire life so far. Wow. That, that was an incredible story. I don't know if you've taken the time to, to recognize, you know, how strong you are and, Thanks, you know, it, it's just, man, that was, that's, that's incredible. Um, you know, I, I, I won't stick on it too much, but you know, for the purposes of, you know, mental health, um, right. There's going to be a lot of people, um, in a similar situation. Now you, you had, you know, back to back things and, you know, usually it's one part of our life is going and then the others are okay, but you had, you know, um, personal relationship, you know, loss, you had work, um, you know, you had various different things going on in, in different areas of your life. Um, is there anything you would say to yourself now when going to like, you know, I know, um, you talked about the, you know, horror movies and things like that, but like, I'm curious of your perspective now being in a lot better place. Like, would you have told yourself to, you know, I don't know, go to a a friend's place for two or three days and like, just kind of, you know, and process all of, you know, I mean, I, I just, to, to me, you know, I've been in similar, a similar situation to you. Um, and, and I haven't talked about it on, you know, I haven't released those details, mm-hmm. um, of being close to suicide, but it was very similar in terms of multiple different areas of my life going badly mm-hmm. um at the you know at in a in a six to six month period mm-hmm. um and i i honestly don't i mean you know for me as i look at mine i would have said therapy um mm-hmm. for sure in terms of processing um that's that's helped me out a lot um i would have easily said taking a break um and just like going so like just to I, I I think just getting away from the area I'm curious as you look back is is there something you would have said to yourself well you know piling on what did you know help me get out of that the first thing I would definitely tell myself is just lean into the people that love you or that you love so the the you know the best things I did were just get out of the house and get back with people, whether it's, Hey, just go fish with someone for one day. And you get, you get a little bit of that fire back of, you know, feeling like things are right. Or, you know, I don't know what I'm going to get from homecoming, but just go up. Those people, you know, loved you, embraced you go be around them. Something good will come from that. Um, The communication thing is a tough part. I think that's the hardest part. And I think we've seen that in the past five to 10 or probably five years, right? Like, trying to break the stigmas of being able to talk about being in a a tough spot. I think that's huge. So I think the communication um, is a huge thing. I didn't talk to a lot of people when I was struggling, partly I'm sure because of embarrassment or, or maybe not even embarrassment or a mix of that and anxiety of like, you know, it's tough to call someone and say, Hey man, how are you doing? They say, Oh good. I'm at work and this and that. And I say, I'm literally haven't left the house. The lights aren't on and I've watched three movies today and they're like really bad movies. Like, <laughs> so, um, you know, I, th- I think the communication thing was important. I actually really struggled to talk about that stuff at the time. And I had a fraternity brother who was a very close with, I actually just reconnected with and took fishing a couple months ago, which was really fun, but I couldn't talk about the stuff that was going on. So it was kind of weird that I've never told anyone this, but we had a Google doc where I would just go in and just put the things I'm dealing with or feeling. And he would just put some responses in. 
And I actually found that. I totally forgot about it. I like found it a year ago and it's one of the like the most special things I have. I really should print it out and like frame it somewhere. But it's just yeah. like I just say my I have a 97 F-150 that's breaking down. It needs all these repairs. I can't even afford to fix it. And I can't afford a new car. Like, you know, I'm I'm in a really tough spot with this one thing. And then I have some stuff about the personal stuff, the relationship stuff. And to to look back and see you know, the, the trucks and boats and stuff aren't the, the message there. It's like, you know, to look back, see how I felt to how I feel now, realizing that, you know, what John said in his responses there were like, you know, trust yourself, this X, Y, Z, there were the things that really came to fruition and, and helped me get out of that. So I would say communication would be, would be the biggest thing. Trust the people that love you, tell them what's going on. And also, you know, it's, it's really cliche, but like realize that the storms pass, like with most things, you know, even some stuff that was really heavy at the time. Now I can talk about, now I'm talking about on a podcast, right? So it's not this dark cloud that it used to be. And so I would just tell myself, like you, you've been strong with stuff in the past of things that were uncomfortable or challenging. This is just a new wave of that. And that it just feels very different. When you feel when you feel sad about yourself, it's very different than like when you feel stressed about a project or a work deadline or school or whatever it is. But, you know, the, the storm will pass. And, and also the things, the stuff that I felt really dark about, like if you take my position and really break it down to bare bones, like I still was around family. I still had a roof over my head. Like I'm in the top 1% of the planet. So I'd also you know, maybe not uh, so tactfully, but like, you know, things are really good, even though they feel bad. Um, so kind of sack up a little bit and we got to get back on the horse and we just got to go for it. We got to, we got to do something to not feel this way, but take a step back and also appreciate that like the, the, the heavy stuff, if you can isolate that for a second for, you know, I'm not speaking for everyone's case, but there's something good there. There's someone that loves you. You've got something that makes you happy or someone or some place or something. So lean into that stuff and it'll, it'll give you a little bit of superpowers to try to take on the other stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I guess another tough transition, but you know, sure. going from that to now, um, like, like, do you want to talk about, um, your move to Florida and, and being at Costa sunglasses and, and maybe, yeah um you know how that time period of your life was yeah um i was a tall pasty yankee boy as they call us down here i moved down here they can tell you're not from here right away even without seeing your license plate you know when you got my polo shirt on or whatever it may be my new england attire and yeah. so there was definitely a culture shock um you know like i said i found a place to live uh, off craigslist it was 500 bucks a month um, it was me, this other gentleman who was very nice to me and gave me a place to live and it, his pit bull and, uh, you know, have some really classic, funny, like Florida man store. Like, you know, a lot of the Florida man stuff is blown up to be like a funny meme on the internet. And some of it is like wildly true where you're like, <laughs> that, that can't actually be happening. And you're like, oh yeah, no, it's just the neighbor that's happening. So, yeah. um, it was a, a culture shock moving down here. Um, but fell in love with my job early and I just gave like everything to my job, you know, at the risk of outing hosting Costa, my starting salary was not, not a ton. I did not have a lot of money. And, uh, you know, I just gave literally every, I just like fell in love with work. And the moment I woke up, I just went straight to work. I stayed there until everyone left. I stayed after everyone left and did more stuff. A couple times I set off the alarm leaving the building. Sorry to the janitor who had a good deal with that. But, <laughs> um, you know, and, and with that, I found a lot of reward, right? Where like, if you're willing to go above and beyond, people respect you, they appreciate you. They not, and it, it became this thing where I just fell in love with this whole process, the community. And I was very grateful that the position I took on, I got to travel a lot. So I got to go places and, you know, if your employer asked you to, at the time I'd barely pulled boat trailers, they were like, Hey, that like 3,500 diesel truck, 
you're going to attach it to that 30 foot of 34 foot airstream 32 foot airstream trailer i need you to drive that 17 hours to virginia and i was like all right like we'll figure <laughs> it out as we go yeah and drove like my first year at costa i flew like 100 flight segments i drove like 15,000 miles with trailers i was just everywhere and gave my entire life to it <clears throat> i made some relationships that i'll have for life close you know co-workers that became best friends that became friends that like you know i could not see for 10 years and it would be like the same thing the next day so um i i saw the reward of of just like a very Gary V style, like just if this is where you want to be in the future, you need to not focus on a dollar. You need to not focus on any credentials. Just go to work and give it everything you have and, you know, sleep as little as is most appropriate for your health and for your, your, your mental stability. And then outside of that, like, just go, just give it your all. And so I did that with Costa, uh, got a couple of different bumps and jobs and moved into new roles and, really found myself at, at the helm of some really cool things that was early in my career that I never expected to. And so that was a really, really special time. Um, but if I could say, I uh, kind of pass on one thing from that is like when it feels like the right, just like give it your all. I don't think you'll ever regret, you know, if you give it your all for a certain amount of time, even through some of the tough parts, you'll either find out that that's not for you, which is a good thing to learn, right? So like, yeah. I'm going to try for two years that this fishing industry, I'm going to give it everything. At two years, maybe I decide I, you know, want to do X or Y or Z now, and that isn't it. Or you might realize that is it. And if it is like triple down and you're going to see the reward tenfold in the future. So that, uh, those jobs were really cool. I've got some really wild memories. It was at the time, the company was like in between, going into like mega big business and, and like a medium scale business. And so there was a lot of flexibility and there was a lot of really cool things I got to do that like I could call work that, you know, I don't know if I'll ever find a job that would call that work again. So that was, uh, that was really, really cool and kind of led into where I'm at now. Yeah. So, um, you know, springtime media, July, 2020, um, you know, starting your own marketing business and, um, you know, high roller guide service, mm -hmm. you know, do you want to talk about those two things and how those got started? Yeah. Um, so, so Costa had some changes, uh, go on with like, um, there was a merger at the top of the company, um, as um, it's very cliche, right? Like mergers happen, big business acquisitions happen, all these things. It, it's shuffled up Costa a lot. Um, and, I, uh, you know, a lot of people's lives were changed. People lost jobs, whatever. Um, I was given the opportunity to stay with the company through all that stuff, which was awesome and, and humbling and, and very appreciative for it. And, uh, you know, at the risk of still, I'm close with Costa and I really love those guys and still do some work with the, the company, some project work and stuff. So like to, at the risk of not going too into the details there, but some things changed and there was a way where I saw like this golden ticket of, you know, it was the same way I felt a couple of years before. I'm just kind of like, F it. Let's why not? Like, this is the time the world had just gone to shit. There was a zombie outbreak that we all yeah. dealt with. Right. And yeah. so I was like, what, what better time than now? So, um, took advantage of some different things that were happening with Costa. And I said, let's, let's make the leap of faith. And so, I left the company, even though I loved it, even though they were like my friends for life. And it, I thought the couple of years before, like, the, I don't know where if I'll ever work anywhere else again. Like that was the, you know, the MO I had. And so I made the jump and started working, you know, I was trying to find the next gig and started working with one company that couldn't hire me full time, but I said like, Hey, in a small capacity, we could do this or this. I'm like, okay, cool. So I started working with them and then someone else heard, oh, you left Costa. I heard you left Costa. Well, do you think you could do this or this for us? I'm like, oh, cool. And so I did those two. I'm kind of looking at like my time and, you know, my pay and, and my free time and what I can do with things. And I'm like, I think like this, this might be a thing. Like, you know, if I do X and Y and Z for these people and it's like takes up this total amount of my time. Well, I'm used to working 100 hours a week. So if people want X amount of hours, I'm like well, that's kind of like divided by 10, right? And so 
it slowly became, and I learned a lot along the way. I did not leave Costa thinking I'm about to start my own marketing business. Um, it kind of, the dominoes fell into themselves, I guess, if that makes sense. But yeah. um, fast forward, I've now in technically like my third calendar year of business, I've got a full lineup of clients that I work with. Um, it's really cool that I get to work on my own schedule, that I get to do certain things that I really like to do in work and just those things for a lot of people, um, yeah. which is really cool. And I still give the same work ethic, the same passion for everything, but I realized like, Hey, instead of doing that for a hundred hours for one person, you know, maybe I do that for 20 hours for five or 10 hours for 10 or whatever that, you know, whatever that adds up to. So that was part a of making the jump to, to where I'm at now is I was able to build my own income and, and run my own business on the digital side. And the second part being that my, the gig that I moved into with Costa is I ran their pro program. And what that meant is like all the fishing guides, fishing captains, their fishing influencers, their ambassadors, whatever the, the names you want to call it around the country and, and around the world. And so I was surrounded by the best fishing guides on the planet 24 seven at events with them, working on their contracts, working on different projects with them, whatever that may be, working on conservation efforts with them. And I, the, the idea of like being a fishing guide had, had always been something I loved. I, I think when I actually made the leap of faith, I found an old iPad video that I made when I was in like, I don't know, junior high school, maybe. It was yeah. like, I was up there, you know, in between weeks of narrow summer camp or whatever it was. And yeah. Uh, uncle's holding the ipad and i'm saying hi i'm cody rubner captain cody rubner i'm gonna take you out fishing we had a pontoon boat i had like one fishing rod but i <laughs> i'd always been enamored with like this idea of being really connected with the ocean and being able to like tell you what's going to happen and snap of a finger like someone says cast there do this do that and it happens and like to me that was always magic growing up i'm like yeah. how did you you know, like some Cinderella type stuff or uh, what would it be Snow White controlled all the animals. I'm like, whoa, hold on. You just like said that. And, and so it was like this manifestation of everything I loved about the natural world and wanted to protect. And I viewed these fishing guides growing up as like these magicians who like could make it all happen and pull the strings along the way. So I was surrounded by all those people really wanted to become a guide. There's a really interesting culture with guiding around like you know, anyone can start guiding, but there are a lot of ways to start guiding the wrong way, if that makes sense. There's a lot, like there's a hierarchy of respect and rules on the water and level of credentials that you need as far as your understanding of the ocean and your, your ability to run the boat, take care of people, the hospitality, there's a lot of dynamics to it. So um, ended up getting a call from a close friend who I always talked to about this, who was a long-term captain. He said, hey, I, I just found out about this thing going on. I got an opportunity to get you this beautiful custom special boat that's uh, connected with this nonprofit group. Um, would you be interested in getting it? And I had just quit my job. So I had, again, zero income at the time. <laughs> yeah. and, and, you know, at, at the IRS, hopefully they don't listen to this and come get me. But I went through <laughs> the loan application process and they called me and like, all right, so you're going to get this, you know, $42,000 loan for this boat. So, you know, and I couldn't say that I was starting my business. I was, I was doing it through like a personal boat purchase. So um, you're like, all right. And, you know, we got to go through these questions to finalize the loan, this and this and this and this. And the last question was like, you know, do you certify that, you know, Costa Sunglasses is still whatever, you know, is still your main source of income? And it was a white lie because I had one check left to come from Costa. And I said, yep, you know, the, the next check that's coming in is still from Costa. Yeah, yeah. And that wasn't a lie. Yeah. Now, they didn't ask what my future employment was or if I was still employed. But the way he asked the question, I answered with a truthful statement, ended up getting the, uh, getting the loan, getting uh, my, my first, you know, really special boat. And uh, kind of made the jump there of like, okay, I want to figure out how to start cutting my teeth and how to make my way into, into guiding. And so those two splits, they're very different, but at the same time, they're the exact same where I've built this cool ethos of my ability to, you know, slowly get into guiding the right way, take people fishing, to be, have 
credentials and authenticity on the water translates into the work that I can do on the computer, talking about people like that, posting about people like that, imagery, copywriting, whatever that may be. And so those are the two things I do now, two businesses. And it's kind of cool where like tomorrow I'm going to wake up and run a trip and, you know, I'll be up at 4.45 in the morning, go <laughs> run a whole trip. Yeah. yeah be off the water at like say one o'clock get home by two and then i'll work on my computer for four or five hours uh to round out my work day then friday i'll be with uh one of my clients actually uh doing a photo shoot on friday so i'll be on the water doing a different style of creative medium of photography and but on that one like i have to make sure that we catch fish to take photos of so it's just i've set up this really cool thing where like my passions for writing, photography, fishing, being on the water, marine biology, they're all giant combined one thing where yeah. just like everything I'm doing is a little bit different, but I, I love it all. So, yeah. So, you know, with spring tide, I'm, I'm curious, or, or for high roller as well, um, starting the business, mm-hmm. um, there's a lot of fear in that. Um, as you look back, um, you know, do you have any advice on, on getting over that fear? Yeah. So I think the biggest thing I've learned, I still have those fears. Like I have things pop up day to day, week to week that like would, especially four or five years ago, make me really anxious. They still bring me to like here level anxious instead of here. Yeah. But what I've learned is there's always going to be something you don't know or, or you can't expect. And being able to roll with the punches has been like, you, you can't let the fear of like, oh, I might not know how to like, you know, some billing issue, some invoice issue. Like, you know, what if I run my first guide trips? These are, you know, talking in two separate silos, but what if I run my first guide trips and they don't go well? Like there's only one way to learn and it's just do. And you're either going to do it well. And you're going to be like, sweet, I'll do that again. Or are you going to do something bad and be like, okay, I learned something. Now let's do it right. Or let's try again until I can get it right. And so the, the biggest thing I would say is don't be scared of what could go wrong. You just, you have nothing to lose. Like if something goes really wrong, you go like, okay, that wasn't a great business model. Maybe I can, if you're in that entrepreneurial spirit, maybe I, you know, go a different route, try a different business now, or maybe I go back to work for someone else as I try to figure it out really like, you know, there's a lot of people looking for uh, employees right now as the, as things are getting crazy. So um, my, my biggest advice there would just be, don't be afraid of what you don't know. Like I had no clue how to manage appropriately manage my own company from like budgeting to like, you know, 1099 people when you want to bring in contractors to all these different things to how to most appropriately invoice someone when you're a third party. I always process that stuff coming in as a company. And then I was the third party on the outside. And then, you know, had to learn, okay, well, how do you price someone? Like, okay, I think this is how much it's worth. And then if someone says yes, then you're like, well, maybe was it worth more to the underprice myself or, yeah. you know, if they say no, am I overpricing myself or are they just not the right person? They don't see my value. I mean, so many things that I had no clue. Uh, there's only one way to learn, which is just, you got to go for it at some point. If you stay on the diving board, you're, you're never going to get to the other side of the pool. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, with the, the marketing business, you know, clients is obviously the key. Um, any, any tips for, you know, building up your reputation, um, you know, when you're young, um, and then like just getting new clients or things like that. Yeah. So really into, so I'm a couple of years into this business, right? I don't have a website or a business card, which is pretty crazy. And this, this might be unique. I'm not saying that like, that's the solution to everyone, but the reflection from that is all my business early came from word of mouth of like, Oh, I heard Cody left Costa. We should contact him. Or I chatted with someone after at an industry event and said, Oh, I actually left. And it sparked those conversations and the, I owe everything to my relationships in in business. And that's been as much as really when I worked for Costa being willing to go out of my way to help. Hey, you know, I know you're supposed to go to this event, but like, 
it's your kid's recital or whatever, I will happily take my Saturday and go work it for you so you could stay home. So just always provide to everyone else. That was one of Gary V's things is like, just give, 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 provide and never expect a turn. So it's not, hey, Arnov, you know, I'll, I'll uh, you know, come help you with this or I'll hop on your podcast or I'll send you this thing. And then a couple of days later, like, hey, I sent you that thing, you know, you got anything. It's just like, oh, I'll, I'll happily take care of you, man. And then just on to the next thing. How else can I help someone else around me? And how else can I help someone else around me? You'll you'll build these really strong relationships where, you know, I had some pros that my relationships with them started as like just helping with their contract or sending them some sunglasses or whatever that may be. They're now like friends that I'm, I'm at their weddings and I would go above and beyond to, you know, if they were going through a tough time, I would send them money in a heartbeat or, or help or volunteer wherever I could. Like always just provide to everyone else and try to take care of everyone else. And in the long run, you'll build really strong relationships. And when you have a relationship with someone, it's way easier to, you know, hey, Arnold, holler at me, man. I want to chat. Like, what you got going on? I think we could work together like this. And people would be more excited to work with someone who they like to work with yeah. than maybe someone who's there in every silo of the digital stuff I work. Like, there's people better photographers than me. There's some like really formal copywriters. There's some re- like, but outside of that, if you take away the individual tasks, people are going to want to work with people that if they have to do a call with them every Monday, they want to work with someone who they like talking to that is authentic that, Hey, how is the fishing going? They can actually talk about the fishing side and okay, let's, you know, find a way now to build that ad for the magazine. That's about a fishing product. They're going to want to work with someone who's enjoyable to work with who they trust like all the human dynamics of business get really overlooked i think a lot of times where you know uh, i see some people trying to start their own marketing businesses and it's always they always want to say my client did x like it's just they're trying to like verbally you know solidify that they're a business or validate themselves i guess is the best way and in reality on the digital side i I do no personal marketing with the business. It's all been through relationships and how can I take what I know how to do for your company, not, not for myself. So that would be the, uh, the biggest, I think, recommendation would just be realize that early relationships are really, really important. And you're going to have to give a lot. Like I know I've seen some younger kids in my industry that like have the certain level of expectation, like they're owed some sort of opportunity and in reality it's like you know maybe this person's going to choose to work with me over you because I was willing to go above and beyond to like go out of my way to spend my own money to send them like some care package related to something we talked about weeks ago but I was willing to go above and beyond to show them I actually cared about them as a human fast forward two and a half years they're now the new director of x at this company and they thought of me as, oh, maybe that's a person who can help us solve this problem. So uh, relationships is like, I, I owe everything to, to the people who have given me the opportunity. And I just feel indebted to work my ass off for them to, you know, make amends. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in terms of the skills, as you talked about, whether it's photography, videoing, marketing, mm-hmm. uh, whatnot, um, you know, how, how did you build those skills? Do you have any advice for someone trying to build up those skills? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say, you know, someone might say like, oh, well, you've got a fancy camera or, you know, you've got X or Y, maybe try to project some sort of advantage. In reality, I was like all self-taught on all, I didn't take any photography classes. Like I never took I took writing classes, the ones they made you. I like wrote those essays last minute. I hated them. I didn't read half the books. Like, sorry to all my teachers. I spark noted and (laughs) read the spark notes in my essay. Like there's a reason why like history and English and all those were my horrible classes. I hated that stuff. Yeah. But um, on, on the outside of, you know, more formal training, I just loved this stuff. So I, every minute of like when I'm hanging on the couch, I don't watch some random Netflix show. Like I'm YouTube in different videos about photography, how can how certain cameras work, how trucks, boat things, fishing stuff. I just consume as much as possible. And um, I would say on, on that side, there's two things, which is one, just consume as much as you can realize that 
There's so much educational content out there for free that it's crazy. You don't need to buy any classes. You don't like, I'm sure a formal class would be great, but for most people, if you really love something, and you want to learn about it, you can find a lot of stuff online really quickly. And then the second thing is just surround yourself. With people who are really good at that stuff. And so you really want to get in photography, like, you know, show some appreciation to the best photographers and help them out on X, Y, and Z, you know, offer to do some free work for them, whatever it may be, but just surround yourself with those people. And you'll be, if you're a sponge for information, they're going to realize that. And you can get a lot from being around people who are really good at what you want to do. Yeah. Uh, in, in terms of the fishing guide uh, business, you know, for anyone listening, like, um, you know, who, who, like, when should someone hire a fishing guide? What does a typical day look like? What, like, why should someone like, what, what type of situation, um, arises where, you know, a fishing guide is, Hey, this is a good idea for. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, th I think that's fair. And definitely feel free to check me here along the way. If I ever go down the fishing rabbit hole in a way that you're like, Whoa, like no, no. regular land, you know, mammals. <laughs> but, uh, you know, so the concept of a fishing guide, it sounds kind of crazy, right? Cause you're like, hold on, you're on the water for like four to eight hours. And it's like five, six, seven, 800. Like if you go with the good guys, a thousand dollars, you're like, wow, it's, that's a lot for a day of yeah. fishing. Right. So like, yeah. what is that? So the reason you would hire a fishing guy is like, obviously there's certain things you want to accomplish. So you either want to catch something that you'd, you know, you'd love to catch and bring home for yourself, or there's a trophy fish that you wouldn't eat, but you've always wanted to catch and, and cross off your bucket list, or, you know, you're just looking for something to do on a vacation, bachelor party, whatever it may be. So the, the value of fishing guide is uh, these people are top to bottom connected with their water. So they know where all the bait fish ebb and flow, where all the fish that they're targeting, where they ebb and flow, all the little details from line sizes to hook sizes, to the type rods you'd use, to the individual feathers you put in the flies, all these little details increase your odds of success. And so why you would pay a fishing guide is you're paying an hourly rate for them to go take you out fishing. And you're going to target a certain thing depending on the time of the year. But the reason why you would pay them is you're paying for, you know, obviously the boat, the gas, some of the operational costs, but then the intellectual property of, wow, I'd really love to catch a snook. Well, I know they sit behind that third pole on the hard outgoing tide two hours into the outgoing tide. But that's my intellectual property that if you have that guidance and I can say, hey, and, you know, hold the rod like this and, you know, don't, when you set the hook, don't do this. These little things that increase your, your odds of success. And that's how you help, you know, people make memories. And so what I really love about it personally is like some of the moments of, you know, I had someone catch a fish that they've really been after a couple of weeks ago and they turned to his buddy and like right after it, he just goes, I love this guy, man. I love this guy. <laughs> and that was cool. Like, you know, yeah. that was a moment of like, I helped him accomplish something. And it was like, uh, you know, this, this life goal of his. Uh, and so it feels really special. And so growing up, I did a lot of fishing. Now I would say I'm the best fisherman I ever have been in my life personally, not compared to other people. Um, and I fish like a 10th of what I used to yeah. because I've learned that like, okay, if I can explain verbally to someone how to do something, give them all the gear, put them in the perfect position, I'm controlling the boat, I'm managing all the variables around us, of other boats and where they hook the fish, where it's going, all these different things to react to. And if I can do all of that through someone that doesn't know what they're doing and the fish gets to the boat, I'm like, well, I definitely could have caught that fish on my own. Like, so it's this really fulfilling thing of like, okay, I know what I'm doing. I throw the bait out there. I catch the fish. I bring them in. This is my end goal just to do that a lot in life. Not Maybe if I had a big ego and I was chasing like certain records, I'm, that's not the style of fisherman I am. Yeah. I'm like, wow. You know, I get 10 times, hundred times the amount of enjoyment, pride, whatever out of like, if you came down tomorrow and you're like, dude, I have no clue what I'm doing. <laughs> Yeah. And you catch a couple of fish tomorrow and you're like, that was the coolest thing I've ever done. Yeah. That means the world to me. So, you know, that's my own view of why I love it. To take one step back to your question, that's why you'd hire a fishing guide is, okay, I understand that 
we could rent, you know, we could fish from lands, only limited opportunities. We could rent a boat, but then we need all of our own gear and everything. In the end, the total value cost of like, hold on, I can get an expert to take me right to it at the right time, give me all the gear, there's drinks and, you know, food and drinks in the cooler, there's bait in the live well already, and I just get to fish. You know, one of the things is my, my captain's license. Uh, I can take a bunch of people fishing. You don't need a license. You're under my license as a, you know, a, a commercial vessel. And so you don't need license or anything. Like I just get to step on the boat and enjoy the best fishing has to offer. And it costs me a couple hundred bucks. So that's why you'd hire a fishing guide is it's a shortcut to the best experience possible with fishing. Yeah. You, you talked about it there, but, um, you know, do you have any tips on, becoming a fishing guide or getting your captain's license? Yeah, the, the captain's license process at the risk of downplaying it, you know, I, you got to take it seriously because these are the things you need to know to be responsible on the water, really to be safe. The fishing guide business like is less about fishing as much as it is safety and hospitality. Like if you and your grandfather book a, a fishing trip and I've got an 85 year old guy on the boat, my goal is to keep him hydrated in the sun keep them you know make sure that he's eating drinking make sure that we're not hitting waves a certain way or he's banging hard where it's hurting his back make sure he's got the opportunity to comfortably fish right so i can't take him out in big waves and say hey go stand on the bow you know like my young kids it would be all crazy and this is hilarious for you know whatever sea spray i have to judge every person's ability and also judge you know what they're looking for i've had some people that caught two or three fish and they go like wow sweet like we got numbers off the board like that was so cool we caught a ton of them and in my head i'm thinking like oh okay you know <laughs> other people might want it. they catch 30 snook and they're like okay i want to catch this and this now like we got to go so it's about judging people's experience giving them the experience they want some people just want to catch fish some people want to learn everything about the local environment the buildings we're passing the places like so you know, realizing, I would say early that being a fishing guide is not being a fishing hero. You're, you're not the superstar. You're not Jeremy Wade. We all saw Jeremy Wade on Animal Planet growing up. That's not what being a fishing guide is. Yeah. You're going to be behind the camera. You know, most of the time you're not going to be in the photos. Um, and your goal is to take care of someone and give them a world-class experience. So um, the captain's uh, license process takes a little bit of time. You take a couple month course. I did mine during the start of COVID. So I actually took mine digitally and you learn how to map, you learn how to do some like old school maritime stuff that you won't do on my, you know, my fancy boat uh, has like, shows me everything that's under the water, under the boat. You know, yeah. I'm not going to take out a map and a compass and be checking out whatever I've got, you know, yeah. a lot of technology these days. But you have to go through that whole process, learn like the lights. So if you run in at night and you see certain lights in the air, you go like, oh, that's a sailboat that's like, under mooring or whatever so i got to go around that so I, you know don't run head first into it like those are the things you learn but not crazy you take you a couple tests you pass them you get your six pack license in the mail a couple months later um so that's the formal part but i would say as far as <clears throat> getting into guiding um you know i'll preface it with like who am i to you know really tell you exactly how a guide should act when i'm young in my career so acknowledging that i'm not speaking from a high high totem pole but it's it's about finding your way into the community the right way so you don't want to show up you don't want to be loud you don't want to say i'm the best you got to book me this 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 you know there's a way to get connected with the local community to to be young, to provide info to others and not expect any in return. And to realize that you're going to have some really tough trips early. Like I've had a couple of trips where I like get off and I'm like, Oh my God, I'm sunburned. Like I have a really bad problem. Like my family and my girlfriend want to kill me of like, I get super locked in and I'll go to like two 30 in the afternoon and I haven't eaten or drinking anything. And wow. then I'm like, okay, I need to, you know, put some sustenance in my body or I'm going to croak here. So um, it's a lot of hard work and you'll have some moments I've had plenty where I'm like, that really stunk. And I'll call Mike, one, one of my mentors, be like, dude, I got to find a new career. Like <laughs> who, who said this fishing guide stuff would be fun. I, I thought it was going to be fun, but, um, you know, for every high moment you'll have, you'll have low moments early. Um, but a, a lot, 
there's one way that you can get into guiding, which um, I didn't in that I stay in, I'm trying to explain this in the least fishy terms possible. I stay in like smaller boats. I work in boats from like 18 feet to 23, 24 feet. So I'm closer to land. I don't go all the way offshore. Yeah. And if you're in the offshore group, you can mate. So like you would clean the boat, you cut the bait, you help the clients with the rods while the respected long tenured captain runs the boat. Yeah. So that's one way. If you're in that side of fishing, you can mate, you can work under someone and learn a ton from them. That's one way to, to get into it, but that doesn't really apply to the, the way that I fish. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, curious, um, you know, for someone listening who has never fished in their life, like any tips for beginners, um, in terms of what the best way to see if you enjoy fishing in terms of you know, uh, what, like go to, go to a lake, get this bait or what, I don't know what any, any thoughts on that? Yeah. I, you know, truthfully, I don't know if I've ever been asked that, but kind of cool to, to think about. I mean, the first context that I'll give people is if they go to start searching, like what they need, fishing stuff's expensive, like, especially the fancy stuff. I mean, like, some of some of the fly rods that I have, like one rod might be twelve hundred dollars. The reel, if you buy the really nice reel, might be twenty four hundred. Like you could be five grand into a single <laughs> set of fishing. Yeah. That's what you need if you want to be like the world class fly fisherman that takes on the biggest tournaments and the meanest fish on the planet. Yeah. You don't need any of that stuff. Like the baseline of just some line on a reel and a rod, they sell what's called a combo. So you get everything put together. You can get one at Walmart for like 40 bucks. You can get two lure, like, you, you know, you, you can get started for really, really cheap. And a, a fun story I can give to that is <clears throat> at UMaine, I was fishing in bass tournaments around the country. And so we would travel, we had a fancy bass boat, we have all the gear, you know, we're trying to do the whole thing of like, we're playing pretend bass, pro bass fishermen as college kids of, oh, here's our sponsors, here's what we wear, whatever. <laughs> yes. Yeah we've got all this stuff. I'm spending every penny I have in college on fishing stuff and travel. And we went to this bass tournament and we went out in the morning, uh, crushed it all day. We've caught a ton of fish. We're feeling really, really good. Like, all right, I think the score we've got, the weight we've got, is going to do really well. We're going to make it to the championship. We came in, we just barely missed the cut. I think it was like top 15. We got like, or top 10, we got 13. The kid who won it were these two gentlemen uh I, they like barely spoke english these asian kids they went out in a boat that just barely beat the regulations of like it was like an aluminum boat with like the minimum horsepower required one kid didn't even want to be out there they didn't have jerseys one kid read a book <laughs> the entire day the other wow. kid casted one lure and they caught a bunch of big fish and they i can't remember if they won or came in second yeah but that's just a perfect perspective of the natural world is random even if you think you got the best stuff like it doesn't mean anything if you put the right lure in from a fish or a hungry fish they'll eat it and you have a cool experience so you don't need a lot to get into fishing um and i think it's there's different types of fishing where like this slower where you could put a bait out under a bobber like very old school and just hang out maybe the bobber goes down and catch something small and you're like that's the coolest thing ever or there's the really hard technical fishing stuff but there's a lot of different types of fishing. Some of them are very intimate where you put on waders, you make your own flies with feathers, tie them to a hook, glue them, and you walk around in rivers and try to catch trout. And some of them are crazy where you like have these giant reels that are electric power. They drop down at 2000 feet and they catch a swordfish and crank them all the way up. Right. So there's, there's so many different types of fishing that I would say to, if you want to get into it, just pick one type that sounds cool to you. And then try to learn a little bit about that and, and make your first step there. What, what do you think, you know, going back to your beginning years was the most enjoyable, like part, was it the challenge of, you know, catching a different type of fish? Was it just, you know, the beauty of being near water or like, what, what, what's like the most fun part in those beginning years? I loved, this is my own personal statement. So maybe like all those things you just said are the reason for other people what, what I loved was like what now the scientific term, I didn't know this as a kid, but like the symbiosis of all the different things working together in the ecosystem. That's what I loved. 
So yeah. like it was less about like, oh, I caught a fish and I was like, why was he there? Why did, why did he eat that? That's crazy. Like, but then the next day I went back and I threw right there. It didn't happen. Like why? There's so many whys. And that was what really excited me. It was like the biggest Rubik's cube, the biggest Sudoku puzzle you could have. I'm like this, this, you know, it should happen like this, but sometimes I try things and they don't happen. And that challenge was what really hooked me of like, it was, you know, the ultimate thing I couldn't solve. So I tried playing guitar for a year. Okay. Well, you just play the chords and it sounds like that. It's very practical. Fishing is like a mix of practical and also stuff you, you can't control at all. So I think that was what hooked me the most as a kid growing up was like trying to figure it out and also realizing that I'd never figure it out where was what, you know, kept me the most enamored. Yeah. Uh, you know, one thing that I noticed was you're a part of the captains for clean water. Um, and, and right now, you know, Senate bill two, five, zero eight is, is something, um, you all, are you know really passionate about can you for those of us that aren't aware of um you know talk about what that bill is trying to get accomplished what where the captains for clean water stand and um you know how people can help out uh you know in supporting your cause yeah so i would say <clears throat> that's a really cool hop of we talked about some classes i did not pay attention in history was one of them I hated it. Like that was my class growing up. I was like, I hate this. Like I'm sleeping through it. I'm skipping it. I don't want to be here. A couple of weeks ago, I was at Tallahassee at Florida state Capitol in you know, suit collar shirt there to speak and public comment on behalf of a conforming bill. That's going to connect to the Senate's proposal for the state budget. That's going to meet the house's state budget and be proposed to the governor. Like, okay, this is, act, this is all the stuff that I skipped. How does a bill become a law of all those yeah. songs that I was asleep for? Yeah. I was sitting in there going like, you know, they're going through Robert's rules. They're acting all the, I'm like, what the hell is going on here? So <clears throat> that was a pretty big change for me. I also, growing up, I always used to say, I hate politics. Like, I don't care what you're a fan of. I don't, I just leave me alone. Like, I don't yeah. want to talk about politics. I don't want to hear Republican, Democrat. I don't even want to hear the topics you guys are complaining about. I just like fishing. I just like my friends. I just like whatever. Yeah. So this has been a, a pretty crazy jump into things that I never thought I would do. But I realized that these are some things that I had to do to, to get involved and to protect what I love. So the really short pitch for it is um, Captain Sir Clean Water is a nonprofit group trying to organize one giant community to restore flow of water to the Everglades. So Everglades for, for people who aren't Floridians, for people still up North, uh, <laughs> the Everglades is like a King Kong movie. There's like pythons and gators and crocodiles and just this totally wild place of South Florida. Um, and about a hundred years ago, um, water, water always flows South. Obviously it flows water would land in Florida flow south through Lake Okeechobee, the biggest lake in Florida, down into the Everglades. The Army Corps of Engineers, and for the interest of agriculture, they actually dammed off the water flow and sent the water flow east and west instead of south to maintain the agricultural land, largely for the sugar industry. That, you know, they, there was gentlemen who had come over, started taking their sugar business to the United States, established it south of the lake and were reaping the rewards of really fertile land that was even better for their growing if water flowed less or they controlled the flow to a you know a perfect level and so water is meant to go south it's now going to the east going to the west the coasts on both sides that are not fit to uh, receive that water is killing the coast so we'd have these giant um you know, outflows to the east, to the west is causing these red tides is sending all this nasty, um, unclean water from the lake to these beautiful coastlines that look like they should look like everything you've seen in Florida, pristine blue water, green seagrass in, um, in on the sandbars and around the mangroves and all this fresh water coming in killed everything. So like where I, where I live now used to be seagrass flats teeming with life there's not a single speck of seagrass like it looks like the moon it's just wow. white sand and so yeah. 
this nonprofit group is trying to unify a voice to make changes to restore the flow of South. So that's the short pitch of what the group does. And this bill, you know, a couple people rang the alarm of, hey, there's something going on here at the state capitol. And so this bill was trying to undermine the whole process the state had just gone through with representatives from fishing and outdoor and the governor of the state and agriculture, sugar industry, these industries all had seats at the table. They redid this giant management plan that's managed by the Army Corps engineers of like, okay, going forward, here's how we're gonna manage the water so it's better for everyone. And that whole process had just gone through. They settled out a new plan. This plan was gonna be way better for the fishermen and outdoorsmen, for the beaches. And this bill was trying to be pushed through the budget process so that it didn't have to go through to public comment. But there was language in there that was going to strap all of the funding for the Everglades restoration project, which is the biggest restoration project on the planet wow. it, by, by scale. And all of the budget for that was going to be strapped towards, okay, you have to approve this bill or you get zero funding. And there was some language in there that we had really big concerns about, about okay, this could affect the projects that we really need to restore the, the flow south, their funding might be at risk amidst a, a couple other things that would affect the rules for how the water is managed at different times. And so at the risk of getting too, too wordy there, there was a lot of concern. And this bill got proposed on a Friday night and it was going to go through the Senate appropriations meeting Tuesday morning. So it was last minute and because it was a budgetary conforming bill, it wasn't a change to current law. There was no need for like three committees and a public hearing, public comment session or, or time window. So Captains of Clean Water, pretty cool. It's like, uh, you know, what I think is the American dream, right? It's, a, it's salt of the earth guys. They're captains, they're fishing guides who started this group or sick of seeing what was happening to their waterways. And they rallied more fishing guides, you know, hotel owners, restaurant owners on the water, anyone who cares about clean water, one unified voice. And so, you know, this type of stuff happened in, in decades past, this type of stuff happened and it was just signed in a bill the next day, you know, into law and it just was that. And so the sugar industry, if someone's ever interested in that, you can look up, there's a book, Moving Water by Amy Green that talks about the you know Floridians 30 plus year battle with the sugar industry and and water management and so if someone wants to get into the weeds there that's a that's a good option but um it was really cool that captain's clean water was able to say hey this is going on and for back-to-back -back weeks we rallied first a small group of people we all went we all spoke to the senate like you guys are threatening our jobs our livelihoods everything we love and we really shook this the you know they thought this was going to quietly sneak through. And all of a sudden, all these people showed up and were very loud. And the next week, we brought even more people. We brought boats. We brought trucks. We parked them on the lawn of the, yeah. of the, the state building and yeah. refused to say, like, hey, this is what we believe. You're threatening it. And what I think is the American dream of, like, people using their, you know, amendment to, to speak, First Amendment, and, hey, we're going to rally together peacefully, and we're going to tell you, in an educated, clean stance, this is what we care about, and you're threatening that, and you guys work for us, to make these laws this way. So we've been in this multi-week fight against this bill. It's currently, the Senate session was supposed to be done, I think, either yesterday or this morning. 2508 is the one thing holding up the entire state budget. And so we were able to, with what we brought to the table the first week, when we went back the second week, they had removed a vast majority of the dangerous language. So we saw like, hey, when you speak up, you can actually be rewarded if you're willing to, you know, take a risk, take your time, take your effort. We had guys who flew up from the Keys. I, my drive with one of the other local captains was like seven hours, six and a half hours, one way, you know, so we all, it took a lot of effort, but it was really, really cool. It was the first time I've ever seen something where it's like, hey, you know, Maybe, maybe this, this whole conspiracy theory of like everything is controlled by the government and da, 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 like maybe we do have a say. Maybe if we really unite and speak up, things do go the way we want to go. So we're in the final days now. Um, unfortunately, due to the timing of this, like you said, what, what can people do? 
you could head to Captain's for Clean Water to learn a little bit more about it. But we're basically right at the end of like, we're about to learn any day how much we got stripped out of this bill. But I have seen the proposal from the House, right? So the House and Senate have to meet and their, their budgets have to, they have to agree to, okay, this is the budget we're going to present to the governor. And the House has everything stripped out. So everything that we hated, they said, okay, we know the governor doesn't like this going on. We've seen the people don't like this going on. We don't want this in there because if you put this in there, like the governor, maybe he shuts down our entire budget. We have to do this all again. You know, they're politicians. So they're kind of scummy and selfish. And they're probably like, if we put this through, maybe we don't get voted back in. And I like my comfortable living and I like my nice incomes and my yeah. industry borders. So that's the fight that we've had going on right now. Um, and one thing that's cool um, is where I work on the water, my, my home now that I, you know, truthfully, I don't see myself ever leaving here. This is a, a place I wanted to live for a handful of years. I moved down here and I'm in love with our fishery and this community. So I'm at the center of the discharges to the East Coast. So I've been here now, this is going into my second season here or working on the water. And I haven't seen the harmful toxic discharges. Thankfully, things have been pretty good uh, since I've been here. But I have this really cool story to tell now to connect people with this fight that's going on and this multi-decade change to institution that's hopefully going to be better for the planet. And so secretly, like everyone books me for fishing trips. And I always tell people like, you just signed up for a class. You just, you just don't know it. Like we're going to yeah. talk about what's going on. I, you know, sometimes people don't want to hear it. They're like, oh, I just would like to catch fish. I don't really want to know what's going on in the world, but that's a, a really cool opportunity is I have the chance now as we're going around the rivers, we're outside in the ocean to tell this story of like, you know, it's a multi-decade, hundreds of millions of dollars are moved by the sugar industry and in, in, you know, political positioning and investments in, you know, um, you know, enforcing policy and this some really, really crazy details to what's gone on in the past 30 years in Florida with our water management, because water in Florida is like liquid gold. Like it's one of the currencies of Florida, clean water. It's a tourism driven economy. The economy in you know 1800s was agricultural driven. Um, now it's a tourism economy. If people stop coming to Florida to visit, to see Mickey Mouse, you know, to yeah. go fishing, to check out the Everglades, to check out the Keys. People stop coming because the ocean's dead. Um, the, the state's going to struggle. So yeah, yeah, that's the long-winded, short-winded version yeah. of what's going on there. But um, definitely, you know, if anyone wants to learn a little bit more, Captain Sir Clean Water, I'm assuming it's .org um, online to learn a bit, a little bit more and hopefully... Uh, going to have some some good news about this bill we've been trying to kill in the next day or two cool cool awesome well cody we we talked about a good amount was there something you wanted to talk about that we didn't get a chance to geez i don't know i mean if we were, weren't on a podcast i'd say we'd have to catch up on the celtics for a while because <laughs> yeah with what's yeah. going on there yeah uh, yeah it's good I was uh, like a diehard fan, like in college, we'd watch the game. Then I'd do a little homework. Then I'd watch Celtics in two where they played the game again at one o'clock and I'd watch oh. it one to three. I watched yeah. it. But this, the start of this season, I became a little bit of a fair weather fan. Arnov. I was like, they stink. They don't <laughs> watching it. And yeah. now they won like 18 out of 20 or whatever it is. I'm back on the bandwagon. I'm yeah, yeah. So they're looking good. Number one defensive team since January 1st. So yeah. We'll see. No, but we'll see what I happens. think uh, no, really. Uh, I'll just close it with I'm appreciative of, of you having me on here. It's cool to talk in a light that I really haven't in a place that I really haven't. Everything I do now is about fishing or outdoors or whatever. So just to take a step back was cool. And I think what you're doing here is is really cool. It's different. I think it's something that needs to be done more, right? Where it's people can tell their stories, but in a way that. You know, it's, it's not about what you've accomplished. It might be like, you know, what did you go through and how could other, how, what did you learn from that? And how could other people, you know, hopefully there's someone listening to this. That's like a young kid that maybe it's not fishing. Maybe they love bowling or they love, I don't know what it is, writing, painting, whatever. My closing statement would just be like, go for it. Like 
go be the world's best painter, like figure out a way. Maybe this, things are always evolving. Like you're a painter and now you do digital art and you're doing that NFT stuff that I kind of understand and don't at all at the same time. Like, you know, whatever it is, just find your lane and, and just go for it. Cause you'll never regret, you know, going for it, even if you miss and get another chance to go for something else. Yeah. No, that was awesome. Uh, Cody, I, I just want to, so first, uh, if people want to support you, what's the best way for them to do that? Uh, I I'm on social media. I use Instagram the most, call me a basic white girl, but I, you know, my, my social media is just Cody Rubner. Um, and you can see a little bit more about what I'm up to, whether it's travels and digital work, some nonprofit conservation work or some, you know, guiding trips and stuff like that. You can see a, a bunch of stuff from that. And, uh, I think that'd be the closest way to like see everything I'm up to. And then whether you want to learn a little bit more about the conservation work or come fishing or do any of that, um, you know, that would be the easiest way it would be social. Cool. Cool. Uh, well, Cody, I, I just want to acknowledge you, man. It was, uh, it was really cool. Um, just you opening up about, you know, um, you know, obviously, your love for fishing, going to Umaine, but then just the the journey after Umaine, because um, that you know obviously I think a lot of us, um, you know, go through tough times, and um, you know uh, it's important for people uh, to learn about you know what others have um, first that they've gone through that and then you know what what lessons and things that you can take from that now being on the other side um you know you know we both knew trevor um who unfortunately passed as well uh mm -hmm. to suicide and and just um you know just trying to destigmatize um that aspect of you know that's part of the human experience and um you know, as you said, you know, you gave some great pieces of advice on, in terms of leaning on the people you love and, you know, taking a step back and, and looking at, you know, how many good things there are going on in your life and all, all that just to um, remember that for anybody else listening, you know, going through a tough time and then just, you know, your, your professional um, success, you know, um, you know, working for a company um, giving it your all for several years and building relationships there and, you know, getting to a point where, um, what, as a 25 year old kid, you're running a, um, you know, a full-time marketing business and fishing guide business. And, um, you know, that's, that, that's not bad at all. You know, that's, that's quite amazing. Um, at that young of an age to, to be doing that, um, and you. just, you know, you know, teaching us about, you know, for those of us that aren't familiar with fishing, you know, the value of guides, you know, how to get started, all of that. Um, and just, you know, the remembering, um, you know, to continue to stay up to date with politics, learn about the oceans, conservation, the Everglades, um, visiting those areas, all of that is uh, really important. So I really appreciate it, Cody. Yeah, man. Of course, the the last part of this is now you have to come down and come fishing sometime. Yeah, yeah, hundred uh, percent. We'll so, do a follow up. Yeah, we'll yeah. Do a follow up where we'll we do a, we'll do a vlog. Yeah, we'll do a vlog. We'll do a vlog. A lot of fun, man. Come on, yeah. come on. It's uh, in July. You might want the fishing good in July, but it might be a little hot. Yeah. <laughs> um, but definitely, I I know uh, everyone's still up north uh, when they look at the weather in the winter, December and January. I think a little bit more incentivized to come visit when I'm like. Yeah. Oh, cold it's only like 70 and they're like okay, <laughs> f you so yeah yeah no 100 percent. we'll we'll make thank that you. happen come on down man that'd be fun yeah, yeah thank you again yes sir of course